Well, it's going to be a little difficult to, uh, to follow that. But I think one of the points that was made repeatedly in that last panel was that one of the things that Richard Holbrook believed in is that the issues that he cared about should be institutionalized. It wasn't just about his work, but that there should be institutions and, and ideas that should follow forward. And that's very much the spirit of this panel. We didn't want this to just be a look back at the life and work of Richard Holbrook, but also to think about how to carry that work forward and to institutionalize it and, and to build on it. Uh, and the title of this panel, I think, speaks to that. The effort here is to understand what still needs to be done, after a period of, of some progress, I would say, what still needs to be done to strengthen both the will and the capacity, or the resolve and the capacity, uh, to act to prevent genocide and mass atrocities, both in the United States and in the international and at the international level. And when we say to, to build the capacity and the resolve, I think people tend to assume government, but the, deliberately this panel is composed to think across civil society, scholarship, public policy, and of course uh, the US administration as kind of key actors in the struggle to, to continue to build uh, better results in the prevention of genocide and mass atrocity. So we have a terrific panel to, to ch take up that challenge. Uh, we're going to start with John Shattuck, who's also a co-sponsor of this event. And thank you very much, John, for bringing this event to us. Uh, John is an international legal scholar and a leading figure in human rights, uh, has been for many years, served as the Assistant Secretary for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor under Bill Clinton, was then at Harvard and then at the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation, and is now the President and the Rector of Central European University, where the Richard Holbrook Center will be established. Renato Uitz is a professor of comparative constitutional law and chair of the comparative constitutional law program at CEU Legal <coughs> Studies and has been teaching at CEU since 2001 on comparative constitutional law, but also on transitional justice and human rights protection. And then we're delighted also to be joined by Michael Posner, who's currently the Assistant Secretary for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor and has been since 2009 and comes to the State Department from Human Rights First, where he served both as executive director and president has been a leading figure in human rights and fair labor issues for, for many, uh, many years. So it's a terrific panel to address how to take the work of Richard Holbrook forward. And John, why don't you kick us off? Thanks very much. And it's a great privilege for CEU to be working here with Brookings on the, this uh, extraordinary uh, set of issues that we're exploring in the life of our uh, colleague and friend, Richard Holbrook. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the one topic that has not yet really emerged so much, which is the, uh, the re remarkable legacy of Richard Holbrook in the Balkans. And I'm going to start by uh, answering the question, uh, why is the Central European University hosting a uh, Richard C. Holbrook Center for the Prevention of Genocide and Conflict Resolution? Um, and the answer is that uh, this is the region in which, that is Central Europe uh, and Southeastern Europe, where the Holbrook legacy in many respects was uh, created in its most vibrant way. We've heard many stories already about it, but I'm going to tell you a few more about the Balkans. Um, it's also the city, uh, Budapest, where a Central European University is located, from which uh, much of the intervention uh, that took place with NATO uh, to uh, stop the atrocities and genocide that was taking place in uh, Bosnia at that time was, was going forward. So it's quite fitting uh, that Central European University uh, join here with Brookings to announce the creation of the Richard Holbrook Center uh, for Conflict Resolution and Genocide Prevention. It's a great pleasure, uh, Kati, to, uh, to be here with you as a distinguished member of our board. And Strobe, thank you so much for, uh, for hosting this event. Let me just say a few words at the outset about uh, the university that I run that uh, is going to host this center. It's kind of a remarkable university. Uh, Richard, uh, actually, Richard and I visited it long before I was ever uh, the president. I mean, it is a university that comes out of the transitions of the Berlin Wall falling and all the changes that took place in Central and Eastern Europe, and the effort to develop, uh, once again, critical thinking and liberal education at the highest level and the highest levels of excellence in the countries of the former Soviet Union, and now, as Strobe said earlier, far beyond. 
It's really a crossroads university because it uh, looks east and west. It also looks to the Middle East and to the south. Uh, Budapest, as you know, was uh, occupied by the Ottomans for many years. Um, it certainly had its share of occupations over the years, and in that sense, it's, <clears throat> it is a crossroads of uh, occupiers, but also a crossroads in which uh, the democracy that is desperately trying to be born again uh, is, uh, is taking seed. So this university is a graduate level university, has 2,000 students, uh, will soon have that many, um, focusing on social sciences, humanities, law, and public policy. It's creating the first uh, school of uh, public policy and international affairs in the region. Uh, the new dean is in fact a senior fellow at Brookings, uh, non-resident <coughs> Wolfgang Reinecke, so we have many ties here between the university and, uh, and, and uh, Brookings itself. Let me say some words, a few words, about the Holbrook legacy and the Holbrook strategy, very specifically, in the Balkans. Like everything else about the man, it was a strategy that was uh, unconventional, bold, and in many respects overturned a lot of the previous thoughts that had gone into this uh, terrible war in terms of efforts to try to end it. We all know that the war was essentially the product of uh, cynical leaders coming out of the post-communist era, uh, vying for their own ability to move forward. Um, there's a story, I think I heard it from Richard, that uh, the war basically started on a paper napkin in a dinner that uh, Slobodan Milosevic and Franjo Tudjman had together where they drew a picture of Bosnia sometime about 1991 and looked at how they might, in fact, uh, occupy it uh, themselves. It was a war, of course, that had a very weak uh, response, both in the United States and in uh, Europe. Um, famously, uh, James Baker saying, we have uh, no dog in that fight in 1991. And that resulted in an, uh, an endless and, and feckless uh, period of uh, peacekeeping, which was not keeping any peace by the United Nations, which was really not being given any direction, <coughs> either by the United States or by Europe. And along came uh, Richard, um, and this was a cause uh, which he took uh, very powerfully. And I think what he did in many respects is a forerunner of future efforts, which we're going to talk about here this morning, uh, to uh, develop strategies for preventing atrocities and stopping genocide. Uh, what he did basically was to challenge the fundamental assumption that all peace exercises in Bosnia had, had taken up till then, which is that you have to work with war criminals. You have to work with the people who are committing these atrocities. Uh, and he took the position that uh, I'll certainly work with them, but they also have to be accountable for what they're doing. And when Srebrenica came along, uh, he dispatched me uh, to uh, look into why it was that these 7,000 men that uh, we all have heard about uh, uh, had gone missing, and I was sent to central Bosnia and Tuzla to interview refugees who were coming out of the Srebrenica area, and in fact there was clear evidence that there had been a mass genocide. He immediately characterized it, along with others in the State Department, as uh, in, in what seemed to be the worst genocide since the Second World War. And he developed a very new strategy for addressing uh, this conflict, a strategy that drew together uh, conventional diplomacy and instruments of justice. He did something that very few diplomats ever do in a situation like this. He embraced the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, which at that point had indicted already uh, several uh, leading figures, including Radovan Karadzic. Uh, he called for human rights investigations on the ground at the very time that he was uh, doing shuttle diplomacy to the Balkan capitals. Um, he had basically four elements of his strategy, which I think took us to the Dayton peace process. First was to spotlight and publicize ongoing mass atrocities. Uh, here again, he sent me and others to uh, the field to conduct intensive human rights investigations. Second, 
he developed a strategy of securing commitments from the leaders uh, on the spot to stop the atrocities that were going on that he was hearing about directly from the field from me and others. I remember several uh, rather scratchy uh, uh, satellite phone conversations that we had when he was landing in Belgrade and I was on the ground in Zenitsa. And he said, Shattuck, you've got to get me more evidence than you've already got me. And uh, so I would ask several people around me, and then the phone would go dead. Uh, but he would then dial me back and uh, take down everything I'd said, went in, confronted Milosevic with some ongoing and immediate ethnic cleansing and, and atrocities that were going on. He took a very uh, even-handed approach uh, toward uh, the various uh, those who were committing these atrocities. He knew that it was important not to take sides, while at the same time to be tough with everyone. And again, that was the role that those of us who were providing him with information <laughs> gave him. He threatened uh, to either start up the bombing again, or perhaps if the, uh, those who he was dealing with didn't respond properly, to, um, uh, to indicate that they might well be subject to indictment by the International uh, Criminal Tribunal. And above all, he decided to isolate war criminals rather than dealing with them. Those who had been indicted by the tribunal, uh, he said he was not going to, uh, he was not going to actually uh, negotiate with, and they were not going to be invited to the table, unlike all of his, uh, all previous negotiations. With more than a touch of irony, Holbrook told Milosevic uh, that he wouldn't negotiate with Karadzic and Mladic. He said, that's your problem. We will not compromise on war criminals. And it was a remarkable new strategy for a diplomat to be using in, in trying not only to end a war, but to stop ongoing atrocities. There are many lessons, I think, that are to be learned from this, above all the ones that we've heard from the morning panel, uh, the earlier panel, that bold action and unfettered by conventional diplomacy is the only way to stop ongoing mass violence. Justice and accountability are every bit a part of the process. Uh, you, can't have, uh, uh, you can't have a peace process after genocide has been committed without justice. And uh, diplomacy must be backed by, credit, by a credible threat of force in order to negotiate the end of a conflict involving mass atrocities. And perhaps most important, because this is all about uh, the Holbrook legacy itself, individual leadership is essential in a multilateral world, leadership that, the leadership that breaks out of collective caution and isn't deterred by the lack of consensus about what to do or how to go about doing it. So we're building on these lessons at Central European University as we contemplate the opening of this Holbrook Center for Conflict Resolution and Genocide Prevention in a region <coughs> where there is very dark history of atrocities. Um, and the center will have, and I'll just very quickly touch on several elements of it and then turn to my other panelists, uh, three dimensions. Training, uh, certainly training in diplomacy, negotiations, case studies drawn from the kinds of subjects that we're talking about here, role playing, civil military relations, human rights advocacy, and uh, certainly the study of international justice. Second, uh, it will have a research component. It will study the historical roots of violent conflict and early warning mechanisms, benefits, and limitations of the doctrine of the responsibility to protect that has since come into being, the role of the media in preventing or in, in some in the wrong hands in promoting uh, mass violence, as in the case of Rwanda, uh, relationship between justice and peacemaking, and the role of law in promoting reconciliation and enabling uh, transitional justice. And finally, the final element, and, and this is a particular uh, tribute to Holbrook, we expect our center to have real-time negotiations. The center and some of the senior fellows in it and senior advisors have themselves been involved in negotiations, whether with Holbrook or with others. Uh, Javier Solana, for example, is a, a major member of our center advisory board. Ghassan Salome, who is a 
uh, former foreign minister of Lebanon, <laughs> was very actively involved in the, in the recent uh, negotiations that were led by Kofi Annan in Syria, and the former Hungarian foreign minister, Peter Balas. Uh, we all expect to engage in real-time negotiations of the type that uh, are needed uh, connecting an academic institution <clears throat> with a more activist uh, and but very careful and even-handed approach and using some of these techniques uh, that Richard Holbrook himself has exemplified. So <laughs> thank you very much, and uh, we look forward to working with anyone here who is interested in the work of this center, including my distinguished <laughs> successor as Assistant Secretary for Human Rights, and Renata Uitz to my left, who is a a uh, distinguished professor at CEU and will be very active in the center. So that's a perfect transition. Renata, why don't you just kick off straight from there? Thank you, and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to be included in this very distinguished panel. Uh, the, the few remarks which, which I prepared really relate to how preventive mechanisms could build on, on the record of, of responses to, to past atrocities ranging from, from mass killings to transition from authoritarian or, or totalitarian regimes. And, and I would like to pick on, on three trends which, which I believe, uh, although at first they might appear terribly obvious, uh, their interaction is, is really not properly accounted for uh, at the moment. The first trend, uh, especially for the, for the last 20 years, has clearly been the convergence of public international law, humanitarian law, international human rights law, and international criminal law. Uh, um, on the one hand, it's a very visible development because you, you see the mushrooming of, inter of international criminal courts and hybrid courts for various conflicts, and now we have the, the permanent um, court in, in The Hague. And, and it's clear that the Yugoslavia Tribunal and the Rwanda Tribunal definitely contributed more efficiently than any other institution before into solidifying uh, standards and principles of international criminal law or international justice, uh, which previously was not seen on the international level. Whether you are speaking about establishing what armed conflict means uh, in, for the purposes of, of criminal responsibility or how do you prosecute rape as an international crime, these institutions definitely did uh, make major contributions. And, and you do see a spillover effect. It's less than, less than a month ago, the European Court of Human Rights found that Russia indeed violated the European Convention uh, and Russia's lack of response to the plight of victims of the Katyn massacre uh, actually amounts to inhuman treatment. This is all about the rights of victims to be treated fairly and compassionately by national authorities in much after mass atrocities. The European Court emphasized in, in its judgment that it was not sufficient for a government to, to acknowledge that there has been a killing 70 years ago, far, far away, and it has to do something with, with our predecessors. That actually governments do have to assist victims in getting the facts right and getting as much as it was possible the information to, uh, about their perished family members in, 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 mass, in mass graves in remote places. This is a very, very important development, and, and I, but I do feel that, that sometimes we might be even a little bit blinded by the convergence because uh, we, of course, capitalize on, on positive developments. At, at the same time, when it comes to discussions about whether, for instance, amnesties have, have a room in the transitional justice or conflict resolution toolkit, or what to do exactly about the responsibility to protect, these debates actually remind us that there are ser serious divides between these formerly independent fields of, of law. I mean, the perspective of of one field which focuses on equal sovereigns and what is in their powers to do is very different from the perspectives of human, human rights defenders who focus on the plight of, of individuals, internally displaced people or stateless people uh, who are living in deplorable conditions as a result of a decade-long conflict 
which might even be a conflict between private warlords. So this gap uh, should be properly accounted for in any preventive mechanism in the future. The second point I want to raise is, is, is probably even more trivial. Uh, we, we are aware that many of the mechanisms, especially post-conflict, <coughs> are extremely legalized. Uh, lawyers are in, called in to draft constitutions, to draft basic charters for institutions, to tell you what a decent Bill of Rights looks like. And when it comes to responding to, to mass conflict, you actually staff your truth commissions or investigation commissions or, or, or courts by lawyers. And then actually you are surprised that not much has changed since the Second World War. And these trials, let's admit, look totally banal. It looks extremely banal that after a mass conflict, which took many, many lives, and even the survivors even suffer more than those who were dead, uh, are then resolved in an air-conditioned room. People are in, nice, are in nicely ironed shirts. Uh, they sit with headphones. And when it comes to the atrocities, which are monstrous, which they have committed, these are reduced to various exhibits, which are neatly typed out on fairly double-spaced pages. And, 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 and these exhibits are then paraded in emotionless voices, one after the other. Uh, so are lawyers not part of the solution? I do believe lawyers are part of the solutions, but they cannot deliver more than this. Trials look like this exactly because you expect them to be performed by independent and impartial tribunals. You expect rules of evidence and requirements of due process to be observed. And as a result, lawyers cannot do much more, more than that. But they can become part of the solution, and I do insist on that. If they are invited and they are seen part of as a much more comprehensive response to mass atrocities. And exactly as you don't involve the designer of a perfect crane as an interior decorator in building your home, you do have to re realize that the solutions they come up with are instrumental, but definitely are not sufficient in handling the impact of mass conflicts 20 or 30 years on. So let me come to my third point which I think is exactly about the, the lasting or the temporal dimension of conflict resolution. Why transitional justice mechanisms are moved to mid-conflict, and so they are not post-conflict mechanisms anymore, you do realize that the same lawyers I was talking about actually do form an important professional network, and they have immense field experience. So there is a network of constitutional lawyers and with, uh, together with human rights lawyers who bring in a totally different set of platforms of dispute resolution, the impact of which is clearly not accounted for. To give a very trivial example, who would have thought in Dayton in 1995 that more than a decade after the constitution was put on paper, there will be a court of law out there which says that the very basic arrangement which, get, which distributed political representation among ethnic groups, Bosniaks uh, uh, and Serbs, uh, the three key ethnic groups in the region, actually violated the European Convention of Human Rights. Nobody. I mean, it's true that the local constituents who were the key negotiators at the time and key constituents of the, political, the body politic, they had 12 years to figure out how to include the others and how to maybe at least translate the constitution, but definitely to consider taking the constitution one step further to turn it from a peace agreement into a functioning representative institution for a new community. It didn't happen. Of course, the European Court of Human Rights judgment, uh, surprising as it is, it could not have been foreseen at the time. And I'm not trying to say that someone had limited imagination at the time of Dayton. But rather what I'm saying is that the European Court of Human Rights judgment brings another player into the, to the field which was not particularly visible at the time of conflict resolution together with national constitutional courts and other bodies. And these are the bodies, the, response, <laughs> the, the, the responses of which need to be accounted for in the future. The, the decision of the European Court of Human Rights in this particular case 
Of course, we'll not solve anything because it still was not implemented. Its enforcement does take a lot of effort, not only from the Council of Europe, but also from many of the NGOs, academics, policy people, and activists on the ground. And I'm very much hoping that CEU Center will be one of the forums and places where this debate can take place and continue from here on. Thank you very much. Mike, uh, we were very grateful that the administration chose to announce the new Atrocities Prevention Board in the lead up to our event. Um, so maybe you could talk a little bit about that, but also about other uh, aspects of the administration's work. This has been an administration quite focused on, on human rights issues from a number of perspectives. So over to you. Thank you. Uh, let me say, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here and to be in such great company. Uh, John and I, in particular, go back a long way and have worked on these issues uh, in a variety of settings, and it's not at all surprising that with uh, John at the helm, the Central European University is taking on this really important mission. Um, I'm also thrilled that uh, we're recognizing here the uh, role that Richard Holberg played, and uh, he's a larger-than-life character and a real leader, and we miss him a great deal. Um, like uh, Kati Martin, my family um, came from Hungary. And my own personal experience with this, if I can just divert for one minute before talking about what we're doing now, my own personal experience was as a child listening to my grandmother's stories of what had happened to her family. Two of her brothers survived, and they told the stories of what had happened to the family. As a young law student, I went to, uh, I got involved uh, in human rights with that history, looking at what was happening in Uganda in the 1970s. Uh, I interviewed over 100 Ugandans. Uh, in exile in 1974 during Idi Amin's time. And what was really striking to me was the lack of any international attention to what was going on. I'm interviewing people who were describing villages destroyed, hundreds of thousands of people being killed, one after another ethnic group being targeted, and yet the world was largely silent. So to me, and all of us come with our own personal histories, but to work in this administration and on these issues in particular is especially important. Uh, President Obama has talked often about um, strengthening our resolve um, through what uh, we've called, and Secretary Clinton keeps calling, principled engagement. We're committed to universal principles applied across the world based on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And we're mindful, whether it's Uganda or Cambodia or Rwanda or Yugoslavia, that the world has too often failed to address these things in real time. And so at, with Samantha Power at the lead, who has had such an important role both in documenting what had happened in Rwanda, who was so involved in the former Yugoslavia, and who now sits in as my counterpart in the White House, um, the president announced uh, last August a uh, presidential study directive which lays out the case for a national security strategy based on genocide prevention. Um, it's based very much on the uh, study task force that Madeleine Albright and William Cohn undertook in 2008 and the recommendations they made. And it led to the announcement last month of the Atrocities Prevention Board. And it, uh, the president announced this at the Holocaust Museum appropriately. It really has three aspects. One is to try to set in motion a set of uh, activities or uh, tools on an interagency basis for uh, preventing and providing early warnings of genocide to prevent these things from happening, uh, critically important. Secondly, to have a set of uh, actions in place that allow a rapid response when situations start to deteriorate and you're in the midst of what is um, a, a, a crisis situation. And third, following up on what John said, um, a notion that essential to this is that there be a peace um, devoted to accountability and justice. And so among the steps that we've taken, um, we are setting up what's called a national intelligence estimate which will evaluate global risks. This is really both to facilitate a more systematic collection of data, but also to make information available on a broader basis throughout our government. We're going to identify risks with the notion that this will help us address those risks. The Treasury Department is working to deploy 
the financial tools at its disposal, asset freezes and the like, targeted sanctions, to move more quickly, to move more decisively, and to make government uh, more uh, 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 effective in basically sanctioning bad behavior, both of governments and importantly of private companies, especially those in the technology sector uh, who are aiding and abetting uh, outrageous behavior. And there was an executive order announced several weeks ago that particularly targeted uh, technology companies working in Syria and Iran. Uh, third, the Department of Defense, critically important in this, uh, is incorporating a set of atrocity prevention doctrines, both in its doctrine and planning. The Joint Staff have prepared a mass atrocity response paper. Uh, the geographic commands are incorporating prevention and response as a priority. Critically important, we talk about whole of government approach. It's easy to talk about it. It's very hard to do it. And this is really one of those instances where across the government, people have come together and said, we recognize we have a set of challenges. We don't have unlimited authority or ability to affect them, but we are going to do more than we've done in a more systematic way. And at state, we're increasing our what we call surge capacity. Uh, Secretary Clinton has set up a <laughs> new civilian security operations bureau, which is going to func focus on these emergency situations, again, prevention, and reaction. Um, in, in my own bureau, John's old bureau, the Democracy, Rights, and Labor Bureau, we're continuing really in the spirit of what John and Richard Holbrook did. We sent teams out to um, southern Sudan and Ethiopia to interview refugees coming out of southern Kordofan. We've done major assessment of what's happening there in real time so that people can't say we don't know what's happening. We're doing the same thing in Syria now with NGOs, with the support of other governments. We're documenting in real time what's happening. We're building capacity. We're facilitating coordination. And we're enhancing communication. Let me say finally, and I'm sure there'll be lots of questions about this. I think we all recognize that we can put the tools in place. We can be smart. We can be bureaucratically effective in doing the best we can do. And that doesn't mean that we're going to get to the place where the Sudans, the Syrias stop happening. It's a reality of life that people behave badly a lot. Uh, sometimes they behave outrageously. Um, what it does mean is that a government, as a government, we should not be caught unaware. We should not be caught where somebody says, did you think of? And we answer no. And we ought to, to the best of our ability, be combining both, as, as John said, diplomatic strategies, the potential use of force, multilateral, bilateral diplomacy, and sanctions in a way that reduces the worst behavior and, in some cases, prevents it from ever occurring. Let me just stop with that. Thank you very much. And I was struck with your opening, uh, your, your personal memory of Uganda in 1973. I mean, we are now in a moment when the United States has deployed special forces uh, to Uganda to help uh, the Ugandan army c capture or kill Joseph Kony, one of the most outrageous uh, warlords out there. So if you think about the, the distance we've traveled from a period in time in which large-scale genocide in Central Africa could go largely unnoticed uh, to where we are today. That doesn't mean there isn't an awful lot of work still to do, however. And I think where we want to take the conversation now is uh, what else needs to be done and where we want to see uh, things moving at both a, a, a U.S. level, at an international level, and in the research uh, and policy debate world. So let me throw the floor open and we'll, we'll go from there. And I think we might take several questions and then come back to the panel a couple of times uh, in, the, in the middle of the room and then we'll go to the back. Thank you. Um, my name is Emily Willard. I work at the National Security Archive. Um, and I had a question um, that was addressed in the previous panel, but also came up in discussion in this panel, um, was wondering how useful the term and the word genocide is in looking at how to prevent um, genocide and mass atrocities, um, looking at how to address it in <laughs> real time, but also looking at how to address um, justice and accountability for past crimes. 
um, because we see that using the term genocide is very controversial and political, um, all the way back to what happened in Armenia, but also in Sudan, Rwanda, Bosnia, um, and even in Guatemala, the recent um, elected president decided to come and say that, deny that genocide took place where the United Nations Truth Commission said that it did. Um, and also what we see happening in Syria and <coughs> Libya. Um, so just if anyone has any comments on where they see the future discourse of defining how to define violence, which then leads to how the international community will react to addressing that violence. Thanks. And let me take a gentleman with a My name is Larry Cherugino. I, I guess I'm, I'm struck by the absence of a military member on this, on this esteemed panel here, and uh, because I think one of the central policy issues prospectively here is the potential use of force. So I would be interested in the, in the point of view of the <coughs> panel on how we make that decision. Where's, where are the principles engaged in this, and, and not from necessarily the, the point of view of the uh, of a single nation, ours, but international forces, quasi-military forces, intervention of any kind that is uh, Clausewitzian, that is, moves beyond the diplomatic to the, to the force. Thank you. Thanks, let me take one more at the back. <coughs> Gentleman at the back. Yep. Uh, Lawrence Freeman from um, ER Magazine, African Desk. Uh, how concerned are you about going down the slippery slope of using humanitarian intervention for military uh, regime change. There's been a big backlash in the U.S. Congress uh, by the Russians uh, against what was done in Libya where an alleged atrocity was used to overthrow a government. You have now Senator Webb, who's very close to the military, has introduced a bill, or will, no, he has, into the Senate, saying that the president does not have the right to use military force on the grounds of so-called humanitarian intervention. He says, I can't even define what that means. And that would totally overturn the responsibilities to find in the US Constitution that the Congress is the only one to declare war. So now you are on a slippery slope where you can claim, oh, it is a humanitarian intervention following from Tony Blair's responsibility to protect doctrine. And the Russians, even recently, both Medvedev and Putin said no. National sovereignty is primary, and I agree with them. And if you can claim this genocide in South Kordofan, which I just came back from last month, and you can claim this and you can claim that, then you have the authority to overturn the nation state, which was set up after the Treaty of Westphalia. I think that's very dangerous, so I'd like to know how you respond to that. And the fact that the US Congress and Congressman Jones in the House also has a bill restricting the president for military intervention I consider those good patriotic responses to this type of global right to intervene. It reminds me just very briefly when we were negotiating, I was in Kofi Annan's office when we were negotiating the responsibility to protect, <laughs> and one of our interlocutors at the time was uh, Newt Gingrich, who was running a study, uh, USAP, on how to strengthen the UN. And he came to meet us at one session, and he said, I have good news for you, and I have bad news for you. The good news is the United States is going to support the concept of the responsibility to protect. The bad news is the United States is going to support the concept of the responsibility to protect, and we sort of went from there. Uh, and I think all of these questions come to these, these central issues of sort of how do we think about the, the term and the framework for the use of force in response to, to mass atrocity. So Mike, why don't you start and we'll work right back. Well, let me say first of all on the term uh, genocide, I think you know, we've been very careful in setting up the uh, prevention board that we're using the term uh, atrocity or mass atrocity. Uh, I think we're looking at uh, actions that are distinct because they're systematic, they're widespread, and there's gross abuses. Um, so I, it, the term genocide does have a value, but I think if we wind up only using that term, we don't deal with some of the things that all of us <clears throat> know and realize need to be addressed, and I think uh, that's the right way forward. On the second, two, the second and third question, which are sort of mere images of the other. I, I think uh, there are a range of things that are uppermost in our mind. I don't think there is a one-size-fits-all fit all response to the use of force. As John said, I don't think you can take it off the table. 
Uh, that doesn't mean that it's always uh, uh, going to be used. Um, and I would distinguish, as a, to illustrate that, what we did in Libya and what we're doing now in Syria. Um, we, we have to be mindful of the uh, practical limitations of our military and the risks that you've identified uh, in the last question of uh, extending ourselves where there isn't uh, uh, legitimacy globally or within the region, and where the facts and circumstances uh, don't make a military response practically effective. In Libya, we had a country that was geographically divi divided, where you had a local population that was not only um, positive or open to our intervening or having some kind of a military response, they were desperate for it. It was clear that in Benghazi that if there hadn't been a NATO coalition response, there would have been a bloodbath, a massacre. We also had the support of the Arab League. We had the support of the Security Council. All of those factors weighed on the decision of whether to intervene. And I think now, looking back retrospectively, we saved lives and we created a better environment. Not an easy environment, but one that I think we can easily justify. Those circumstances, or many of them, don't hold in Syria. And so I think there is a recognition on our part that a U.S. military intervention or a NATO intervention may, in fact, further militarize the conflict. Again, one can debate that. But I think what I'm saying is that there needs to be a recognition that the world is a complicated place. And as we face Kordofan or we face Syria, we've got to be mindful of the military practicality, the political legitimacy, local views and opinions, the practicality of what we're doing. But we've not, we never should be in the place where we abandon people that are in desperate shape. So we've got to have as an option the notion that there will be some form of intervention that may at some point include uh, military intervention from us or others. That's where we are in these situations. And I think inevitably, it doesn't, it's not going to satisfy everybody, but we've got to take these cases one at a time. It certainly is true that it would be uh, helpful to this discussion to have a military voice sitting on the panel. I agree with the point that was made back here. On the other hand, I would say um, the voice, in a sense, that's uh, overarching in this whole discussion has been that of Richard Holbrook, who is, uh, who is very quick to um, uh, establish alliances and clear connections with uh, those who would be able to exercise military judgment better than he. And so I think uh, what above all is needed is this careful uh, connection between uh, civilian and military authorities. But uh, let me go back to the first question relating to genocide. Um, because I think it is, a, it is a very loaded term, to be sure. It's also a term with very specific legal meaning and often is thrown around in ways that um, don't suggest that the person using it understands the legal meaning. The legal meaning basically being the intention uh, to destroy uh, on the basis of uh, a person, on the basis of ethnicity or religion, um, in particular, or race, uh, a, a, an entire uh, group. Um, and the intention clearly has to be there. There were some very difficult moments early in the post-Cold War era, particularly around Rwanda, where um, genocide became, in a sense, the property of the lawyers, that is to say, the, the policy makers uh, essentially uh, turn to the lawyers to see whether or not something should be labeled a genocide. And in the case of Rwanda, it was particularly painful because I think uh, there is a legal convention, many people here know it, the Genocide Convention, uh, which the United States has signed, which actually calls for those who have signed it to take appropriate action uh, under circumstances where a genocide is taking place. And so what happened in Rwanda was that the policymakers took the position that we don't really know what this is, and we are very preoccupied with other things, and it seems to be mass violence. 
The lawyers then took hold of it and essentially said, we're not going to label it genocide because to do so would be to indicate that there would have to be a policy response. Um, and uh, down at my level, which was uh, the level that Mike uh, is now performing at the State Department, uh, we were essentially prohibited from calling what we saw on the ground, and I traveled throughout uh, the region and interviewed in Rwanda, what was clearly a genocide, we were prevented by State Department lawyers doing their job uh, from calling it a genocide. So we need to get, we, we need to overcome this kind of legal crisis of the terminology of genocide. I think that the use of the term mass atrocities here is a very appropriate one. Uh, ultimately, the judgment is going to be a matter for the courts, to be sure. But what we see in the case of mass atrocities may not carry the same level of intent uh, that genocide carries, but it may be something that needs to be addressed. Finally, on the question of uh, uh, intervention, humanitarian intervention, the responsibility to, to protect, yes. Uh, and I think it's, it's certainly true, um, uh, as Bruce suggested, that uh, there is both good news and bad news here, which is that we don't this is a doctrine that is very difficult to uh, explain in, in great detail. It is very situational, um, and, it determ and it depends on a number of important uh, criteria being met, first and foremost being uh, the legitimacy and the legal, uh, uh, the, the legal determination, in my view, at a UN Security Council level, uh, that uh, some military force is necessary because uh, a failed state or a failing state has failed to provide uh, protection for uh, civilians who are then subject to mass atrocities. And finally, a criterion which involves the exhaustion of all other uh, possible means, diplomatic uh, sanctions, other kinds of means that don't involve the use of force. But in the end, as I think uh, most military specialists in this field would agree, uh, there has to be at least the, the option and the threat of the use of force, which was very effective in bringing the end to the war in Bosnia, as I said earlier, through the means by which uh, Richard Holbrook uh, was able to uh, constantly refer to the prospect of force being used again if the atrocities continued. I mean, two, two very quick points, because a, a lot of the things were already said uh, about politicization and the politics of, of genocide. I mean, you have to be mindful of the fact, in addition to all the other things, that this is extremely locally context-dependent. So uh, the fact, for instance, that in, in, in France, the genocide denial law was stopped by the Constitutional Council doesn't mean that the French are totally pro-genocide, go for it and encourage everyone, but rather uh, that the national discourse for, for a long time and for many totally incidental factors reached a point where the genocide uh, uh, denial law became a vehicle of restricting freedom of speech to, put to previously unseen proportions. And that's a very different story from, from say, Armenian genocide and, and Turkey. So. Uh, I, and I do believe that, that many of the preventive mechanisms do have to also be mindful of, of these local differences, otherwise we, we are missing quite a bit on, on the efficiency side. Now when it comes to, uh, to the military response, I mean obviously the earlier uh, and, and having, uh, adding to, to, to what John has just said, I mean, the earlier the, the warning mechanism, the, the broader your network, your signaling network can actually become, which means that you can actually and do have to rely on uh, a range of different national and regional professional networks, not all of them are governmental, which can supply uh, decision makers with, with a wealth of information and, and also an opportunity to, to signal to significant players that something is going wrong at a terribly uh, rapid speed. So it's not simply a military response or economic sanctions, but actually sometimes uh, you have much softer means which, which then can become uh, part, part of the toolkit 
and this is all the more important, I, I believe, uh, because you cannot pretend that all of your perpetrators or potential perpetrators are state actors. History shows that these are not state actors, and, and once you are dealing with, with non-state actors here, uh, traditional toolkits are not as efficient uh, in practice <coughs> as they look on, on paper. So I would like just to put that on, on the table. Uh, we're coming close to the end of time, but I think what we're going to do is take a lightning round. I'll take uh, three very quick <coughs> questions and then come back to the panel for very quick uh, final remarks uh, in the middle of the room. Hi. name is Joe Guggenheim. Uh, in the question of genocide and also the question of the problems of refugees and displaced persons resulting from genocide, it always seemed to me that a much greater uh, activity could be undertaken by the U.S. Defense Department to somewhat reorder some of the tasks that they take so that they would have the ability to use the airlift capacity and the stationing of supplies to bring aid quickly to refugees around the world. It would be, a, to me, a massive change in some of the role of the Defense Department. But I wonder what you think about that and are we doing anything along the lines of using our military to uh, deliver uh, humanitarian aid in a more effective and more ongoing way. Right in front of you. Right. Um, I would like to thank the uh, uh, gentleman there for telling us that uh, um, now there's going to be some uh, accountability and uh, uh, measures put in place to identify risk before things escalate. I am from Africa and uh, as an African woman, I always wondered why is it that um, when there is atrocity against African women, um, the international community does not work hard enough to bring the perpetrator to, to justice, like why the women of Bosnia would have uh, justice and not women of Africa. And I would like to ask the gentleman, how are you going to be uh, able to identify this, for instance, in Africa before you get out of control? Because this, uh, the problems in Africa seem to be um, so complex and that we have the feeling the, 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 the usual thing is to listen to what authorities in place tells the U.S. Uh, uh, authorities and until things get out of control, nothing gets done. And uh, also I was wondering if maybe uh, uh, tapping into the uh, uh, diaspora in the U.S. may help you get the, that information back in the continent. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. My name is Karwan Zavari. I'm from the Kurdistan region. Um, my question is going to be critical of our government, the U.S. government. Sometimes we purposely overlook some of the atrocities being carried out, uh, perhaps because of our interests, whether, whether it's trade's interest or arms interests. Um, and I'll give you two examples. One, um, under the, during the 1980s, Saddam was carrying out all these mass killings, mass atrocities, uh, but we kept that subject quiet because we had uh, arms treaty with uh, Saddam and Saddam being enemy of my enemy being the friend. And it wasn't until recently, and even until recently, we were still discovering uh, mass graves. Um, the question is, how many Richard Holbrooks do we need to uncover or, or bring, shed some light on some of these atrocities? And one recent example is we are currently overlooking some of the things that are going on in Bahrain. What are we doing with this, especially with the creation of this Atrocities Prevention Board to perhaps shed some light even with, with the countries that we have trade agreements or that are not to the best of our interest <coughs> as a national interest? Thank you. Thanks very much. And I'm going to add one question and we'll go from my right to, and we'll go down the room. So if uh, each of you is speaking in a personal capacity, if you had your wish list, if you could achieve anything right now, if you were going if you had to have one additional tool, mechanism, or law at your disposal at either the U.S. government level or the international level, what would it be? What's the one other thing that we most need to be able to effectively prevent genocide and mass atrocity? So let's start with you. And then. That was unfair. <laughs> well, you can answer the other questions too. So, well, the other questions went the the other direction. Uh, but I mean, the suggestion of, of having 10 more Richard Holbrooks definitely sound good, but, mm -hmm. but actually having teams of experts with very, very different skills at the table, not only military people and lawyers and historians and social scientists, uh, but also a range of expertise because my sense 
concentrated in, 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 in one room in any of the preventive mechanisms you are building or, or around them. Otherwise, much of the information which we are still collecting will make very, very little sense to people coming from one or the other direction. So someone who has the wisdom, and if it's not one person, then it should be 10, but in the same room, in a good team. John. Um, well, let me start with one that's, that's, I think, coming into being. And I'm so pleased that uh, Mike has uh, described to us this uh, Atrocities Prevention Board. Um, when I go back to the period that I was serving in government, it was clear to me that there was virtually no, there was no bureaucratic incentive uh, for uh, people other than the Richard Holbrooks who operate outside of the bureaucracy to engage on these issues of genocide prevention and mass atrocities prevention. And I think the worst example of that, again, is Rwanda, um, in that um, the bureaucracy basically slept uh, through Rwanda, um, and there were no incentives to have, uh, to have any early warning or action, and there were some people who tried to get it, but it was impossible to get it. So, I think if this Atrocities Prevention Board is going to prove to be the kind of presidential leadership that says, this is important, therefore people at low levels should pay attention and should engage, and their, their rank will be improved if they, in fact, take action uh, to stop a genocide, um, uh, then I think that is very positive. But let me men mention two other laws that I would like to see which are, and I'm here I'm going to be critical of the U.S. government. Um, I would like to see the U.S. government ratify uh, the International Criminal Court. I think so would many of my uh, friends who are in the U.S. government. Uh, the politics of get doing so is almost impossible. But I think the U.S. has significantly lost credibility uh, in the international community relating to these issues because it hasn't ratified the ICC. And I would mention one other, which happens to be a particular concern that, of mine, which is I am deeply troubled by the prospect that an American citizen can, get, can be killed by a drone overseas with very little due process of law as I see it. And I think this is, uh, this is opening the door to uh, significant... Um, well, it's, it, it's just vast changes in the way in which uh, the U.S. government is relating to its own citizens, to, to say nothing of citizens abroad. So I would like to see both of those uh, issues clarified. Mike, I have several questions addressed to you, and then if you okay. want to address the wish list question, too. <clears throat> I'm happy to. Um, first of all, on the issue of refugees and the role of the military, um, my sense is that over the last 15 or 20 years, the military has become much more attuned to a broader humanitarian mission as part of what they do, but there are some limits to that. One limit is that the uh, organizations that are the primary humanitarian uh, deliverers don't want to be part of a military operation. So groups like the Rescue Committee and Care and Save the Children and uh, Oxfam are very conscious of the independent role that they play, but on a tactic, on a just a mechanical level or in terms of logistics, the military in a range of places is doing everything within its power to be a, a partner in that effort, uh, subject to those rules. And the question about uh, African uh, human rights and the role of African women, um, since I worked on the Uganda issue 30 some years ago, four things have changed that are really important. It isn't to say that the problems aren't real, they're very real as you've said. But there is now local advocacy. When I was in Uganda, there were no human rights groups. There are, in fact, very few human rights groups, local human rights groups in sub-Saharan Africa. Today, you can't find a country in, in Africa where there aren't local advocates for women, for human rights, for children, and the like. That's a huge change. Second is technology. You can't do what Idi Amin was doing in 1974 because the world sees it, they see it in real time, they see the visuals on YouTube the next day. The third is what John talked about, an evolving diplomacy. Um, we're about to celebrate the 35th anniversary of DRL, of the Democracy Human Rights Bureau and the State Department. I have a boss, Hillary Clinton, who doesn't let anybody else forget about the importance of empowering women in the world. 
And so I have the wind at my back in a way that my predecessors, and certainly Pat Darien when she came into the State Department in 1977, would have found unbelievable. It doesn't mean we're all the way there, but we moved a great deal. And fourth, and, and also critically important, is a changing dynamic within Africa. You have today leaders like Ellen Johnson Sirleaf running governments who are very mindful of these issues. It doesn't mean we're all the way there. Again, I'm very mindful of the challenges you and we all face, and I agree with you that the, the diaspora here can help us, but I do feel that we're in a different place than we were in the 70s, 80s, 90s, even 10 years ago. Um, on the issue, the last, third question was about tough choices, tough allies, Bahrain you mentioned. Um, one of the things that I'm particularly uh, uh, pleased about, and it's been a, an evolution over the last several years, is the extent to which CENTCOM, General Mattis, the Office of the Secretary of Defense, are very much aligned with what we're trying to do in Bahrain. We have a national security interest. We've articulated that over and over again. But even last week when we announced some extension of security cooperation, we were very clear the human rights situation is not good. In some respects, it's deteriorating. The public statements that have come out of not only state but, um, but out of the military are very clear. We know that the situation is extremely dangerous there, polarized. We talked about increasing polarization, what's happening on the street. Those messages are being re reinforced by, by our military uh, colleagues. So again, we're not there yet. We've got a huge challenge in Bahrain. But there is a real sense that the government understands at all levels where we are. And finally, on the one tool, the greatest thing that we lack is public engagement on these issues. Uh, we lack media attention. Uh, what's happening in Nigeria or Sudan or any of the places, most of the places we're talking about, most Americans have absolutely no idea that it's happening. There, if it's 30 seconds on the nightly news, that's a big deal. Um, very little attention in Congress, frankly. There's a few pet issues, but so many of these issues don't get the attention they deserve. Without public attention, without it, um, the government doesn't feel the pressure it needs, frankly, to do the right thing. So that would be my one wish. I'm more optimistic with John on the International Criminal Court. I think we're moving slowly to engage as we can with the constraints of the law. We've got a lot of educating to do in the Congress, but we're certainly moving in the direction and the court's moving in the direction of being more legitimate here. It's not going to happen overnight. And on the drones, we could have a whole panel on that, but I would say the one thing that's animated Harold Coe's involvement in this in mind is the notion that there are no law-free zones. We talked earlier about the interconnectedness of the law. There are no law-free zones. And so whatever we're doing, there's a legal regime behind it. We can debate the policy implications, but there's a heck of a lot of time and energy trying to figure out what's appropriate, what's legal, and what's right. Thank you very much. Uh, I have to say, if I look back on the last decade or so, it seems to me that we could sum things up in the following way, that 10 years ago, Rwanda, and, and you know, 15 years ago, efforts like that, it was actually relatively easy to avoid acting. Uh, there are always going to be constraints on action. There are always going to be times and places where action is impossible for a range of reasons. But I think between R2P, the Atrocities Prevention Board, some of the experiences we've had, we're shifting the ground a little bit towards where it's more difficult not to act or where the presumption should be and increasingly is that if it's possible to act in a credible way uh, to stop mass atrocities, we will, uh, versus a, uh, a more defensive and an avoidance posture that we've had for a long period of time. That's not to say there aren't still innumerable uh, obstacles, and I hope that this beginning conversation uh, with CEU and with others uh, helps to contribute in the spirit of the man whose uh, life and work we're here to, to commemorate and celebrate. So thank you all for being here today, and thanks for joining me. Thank you for coming.